Welcome back, everyone. I am uh, Vashla Weaver. I'm a political scientist and sociologist at Johns Hopkins, just joined uh, this year. And first, I just want to thank uh, Nathan Connolly and Shawnee Mott and all of the others that, that pulled this together um, and opened it up in this way. Um, so for this panel, I'm, I'm really pleased and excited to see three of my uh, all-time favorite historians uh, of the carceral state together in one place. Uh, uh, Julily Kohler Hausman, um, who is soon to be an associate professor at Cornell, um, and is on a fellowship year. Fingers crossing, knocking um, on wood, that's all there. <laughs> she, um, she's on a fellowship year at the Warren Center at Harvard with Donna Murch, uh, to my immediate uh, left, um, where they're, uh, you know, nobbing elbows with the likes of Heather Thompson and Elizabeth Hinton, uh, also two of my favorite historians. So um, welcome to you, to you both. Uh, Julily has recently um, published uh, Getting Tough, which is a history of um, uh, the war on poverty, uh, I'm sorry, uh, war on welfare initiatives and um, criminal justice um, expansions of the 1960s and 70s, um, and is a regular uh, on my bookshelf. In fact, I think I'm on the back of your book. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> then um, we have uh, Donna Murch, who's going to lead us off. Um, who is um, a professor at Rutgers University, visiting at, at Harvard for the, for the year, um, also one of my favorite historians, uh, wrote Living for the City um, about the, the Panthers in Oakland, um, a really wonderful, amazing, uh, far-reaching book, and is working on a new book manuscript that we're going to hear from today about uh, the war on crack in Los Angeles, and really excited for that book as well. And then uh, Talitha Floria, um, who is at University of Virginia, and she's the Lisa Smith uh, Discovery Associate Professor in African and African American Studies. Only sad that we didn't overlap when I was at UVA. Um, but has another uh, prominent book on my bookshelf uh, called Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. So um, uh, very excited to see the new work um, coming out of these three brilliant historian women. And with that, I'll turn it over to Donna. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to start just by thanking uh, Professor Vesla Weaver for such a kind and generous introduction and to say what an on honor it is to be on this panel with um, all these wonderful, wonderful historians and women historians. Um, I also want to start off by sh thanking uh, Professors Shani Mott, Nathan Connolly, and Bill Eggington for putting together this conference. And it's been so wonderful to see just the whole growth and expansion of mobilization, um, inside our jails and prisons, on our city streets, and our universities against mass incarceration. And it's just been remarkable. We are in a very difficult time politically, but I think there's so much that's happening that's not visible and is not being reported on. And so I'm honored to be here. Um, so the work I'm going to present today is, um, is thinking about rehabilitation and its discontents in the context of mass criminalization in Los Angeles. So seeing the continuity and the, the intensification of forms of suppression and incarceration, which are really ways of treating um, problems that are social and economic at their root. So uh, I'm writing a book on crack in Los Angeles, and this grew out of my earlier work on writing about the Black Panther Party. And the way I became interested in crack is that the Panthers themselves were talking about it all the time, about the ways in which it damaged the long-term legacy of the Black Panther Party and the profound effect that it had on African American communities. In trying to write about crack, what I found out is that it's really impossible to write about crack itself without writing about the war on gangs and the war on drugs, because it's the actual process of prohibition that was so essential to how the economy operated. So today I'm going to read from some work that I've done in thinking about how uh, what has been called the crack epidemic, uh, Clarence Lusane calls it the crack crisis, how that pervasive sense of crisis was shaped by state rhetoric and how it created fault lines within African American communities and people ultimately mobilized against it after the LA Rebellion 92 and then with the Gary Webb revelations in 1996. 
In the winter of 1985, the Los Angeles Police Department unveiled a signature new weapon in the city's drug war. With Chief Daryl Gates co-piloting, the Special Weapons and Tactics Team, SWAT, used a 14-foot battering ram attached to an armored vehicle to break into a house in Pacoima. After tearing a gaping hole in one of the outside walls of the house, police found two women and three children inside eating ice cream. SWAT uncovered negligible quantities of illicit drugs, and the district attorney's attorney subsequently declined to prosecute. In the days following the raid, black clergy and the San Fernando Valley chapter of the NAACP organized a protest rally in a local church. Quote, we don't need new weapons to be tried out on us, argued Reverend Jeffrey Joseph. Of all the methods that, that are there to arrest a person, they decided to use a brand new toy. Not all members of the African American community agreed, however. City Councilman Dave Cunningham, who represented South Los Angeles, praised Gates' actions. Go right ahead, Chief. You do whatever you can to get rid of those rock houses. They're going to destroy the black community if you don't. These divergent responses embodied the core contradiction produced by crack, cocaine, and the war on drugs for African American communities in LA in the 1980s. On the one hand, these, these communities faced an unprecedented scale in the militarization of policing, arrests, and incarceration. But on the other, many people, especially drawn from the ranks of the middle class, saw crack use, distribution, and intercommunity violence as comparable, if not greater, threat. So one of the things I'm arguing in my crack book is that what people experienced as crack, so much of it had to do with state action. But state action wasn't visible because these narratives were used as a way of rationalizing this expansion of militarization. And having lived through this era, so much of the focus was on users and people involved in the informal economy itself. And that focus on the spectacle, in many ways, um, it occluded to look at the actual expansions of state power and militarization, and including this thing that I'll be talking about, the war in gangs and gang injunctions, which were an immense expansion in police power. So to address this sense of urgency, the activist scholar Clarence Lussain used the term drug crisis to differentiate it from the state-sponsored moral panic-driven discourse of the crack epidemic. Lussain's formulation is valuable, not only for its discussion of crack's impact on communities of color in Los Angeles, but also for helping us excavate how the state mobilized and appropriated a range of reactions, including fear, anger, disorientation, um, in African-American communities to justify repression and increased militarization of law enforcement. A core challenge of writing about the drug war is to disentangle the social history of drug use, informal economy, and poverty from law and order narratives rationalizing punishment campaigns. In hindsight, it is clear that the state appropriated real anxieties from black urban communities, such as Harlem and South LA. They were experiencing rapid economic decline and used these concerns to rationalize its wars on drugs and gangs. Not only did the strategy appeal to racial antipathies among white voters, but it also hindered political opposition to the drug war by African Americans who were desperately seeking solutions to the public health and social crises in their neighborhoods. This dynamic was certainly not unique to New York and LA. During the Reagan administration, Democrats and Republicans across the country strongly supported the war on drugs. Given the now infamous racial impact of sentencing for crack cocaine possession, consumption, and distribution, black elected officials near unanimous support for Ronald Reagan's 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act reveals an important paradox. The progressive California Congressman Ronald Dellums, along with 15 other members of the Congressional Black Caucus, actually co-sponsored the bill, which resulted in the 100 to 1 disparity for crack versus powder cocaine in federal drug cases, resulting in the disproportionate incarceration of large numbers of African American offenders. While significant black support for the militarized drug war and wars on drugs and gangs in the 1980s may seem surprising and counterintuitive, this reflects how deeply divisive punishment campaigns were for African American populations. And I want to say something important about this is that in many ways, this was there was a class split in the African-American community about how drug crisis was viewed in the 1980s. So you see the support by politicians, but I think it's actually harder to get at the roots of how people responded who were most affected by this. And this is also an archival program. So I've been 
um, you know, doing ethnographies and interviews with people, ordinary people in Los Angeles. So I just want to make it clear, the group of people I'm talking about are really the black political class in the 1980s, but as we will see, their own vision of the war on drugs and war on gangs changes over time. So in the 1980s, there's a lot of focus on crack and this rhetoric of crisis, but when we get to the the Los Angeles Rebellion in 1992, we begin to see a shift in how people approach it. So this is not a trans-historical claim. It's about a specific moment in Los Angeles in the 1980s, and it does change over time. In 1971, President Richard Nixon coined the phrase war on drugs, but in reality, the undertaking was neither a single coherent entity nor a true war, but rather a succession of executive-sponsored domestic and transnational punishment campaigns spanning the post-war era through today. The declaration of war mandated increasing resources to fight the drug crisis while initiating a war without end. So, you know, it's very common in American policy to use war as a way to think about how to mobilize resources. But as we know, the problem with using war is not only the analogy of violence and um, you know, the, the ultimate analogy of state violence as a way to solve problems, but it also means that wars are, with, wars are potentially without end. How do, you, how do you have a war on an abstract concept like the war on drugs? So it both mobilizes resource, but resources, but also is broad and capacious in ways that um, help support this, what I would call uh, more accurately a punishment campaign. Punitive campaigns against drugs and gangs in LA rationalized a new martial infrastructure. The state applied militarization unequally by, fo by focusing on historic African American and Latino neighborhoods in the south central part of the city. As in counterinsurgency strategy, the geographic application of force meant that particular populations were at high risk not only because of their age and race, but also because of their location. Indeed, by 1992, city sheriffs listed nearly half of African-American men under the age of 25 in Los Angeles County as gang members. The ultimate carceral effects of this mass criminalization can hardly be overstated. The California Department of Corrections CDC prison population increased from 19,623 in 1977 to 162,000 in the year 2000, with over 40% drawn from Los Angeles and 70% drawn from Southern California. By 1990, drug offenses were 34.2% of new admissions to California prisons and 25% of detainees in the LA County Jail, which contained the world's largest urban prison population. The carceral effects were not, however, equally distributed. Numerous studies show the extreme racial disparities of hyperincarceration, the war on drugs, and California arguably led this national trend. By the year 2000, the combined numbers of blacks and Latinos were over 64% of the total population of the CDC. Furthermore, African Americans were roughly 7% of California's general population, but accounted for 31% of the state's prisoners. Major components of the militarized infrastructure of policing of the LAPD, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, and the California Highway Patrol could be traced back to law enforcement's hostile response to the civil unrest in Watts. So one of the really striking things about Los Angeles is that SWAT is created after the Watts Rebellion, and after the 1992 Rebellion, we see these new, a new expansion in forms of criminalization. So the... I think the political history of mass mobilization in Los Angeles is essential to talking about the kinds of criminalizations of populations. What you see in 92 is a shift towards offender-funded justice, where they threw 12,000 people in jail, and literally the city jail system was busting at the seams. So they instituted a thing called offender-funder justice, which was basically uh, providing people with electronic bracelets that they themselves had to pay for. And I want to emphasize that because in many ways this is the future for decarceration is often thinking about braceleting. So whether it's, you know, SWAT is clear and bombastic after Watts, but after 1992 we also see these new expansions in not only criminalization but also extractive methods against people that have been criminalized. SWAT marked a new era in Los Angeles law enforcement, defined by the steady expansion of the use of elite tactical units at the expense of rank-and-file patrol officers. With funding from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, the department created total resources against Southeast Hoodlums, trash, five years later. Responding to community protests, the name was later changed to Community Resources Against Hoodlums, crash. And the organization went on to become the city's most notorious anti-gang unit in the 1980s. With the LASD's program, 
LASD's program Operation Safe Streets and the district attorney's hardcore drug unit following in its wake. And one of the things that happens is not only that you have the expansion of these elite military, militarized units, but the district attorney's office. So the hardcore drug unit is actually a group of prosecutors who wear flap jackets and take on this whole culture and appearance of uh, appearing to be a, essentially an elite commando unit. Another striking feature of departmental militarization, in addition to the personnel restructuring that funneled more manpower and funding towards elite command units, was the LAPD's attempt to expunge all social service components from policing and to focus exclusively on crime and territorial control. So this also was accompanied in the early 70s with the use of helicopters. You know, so the helicopter has become iconic in Los Angeles, but the first helicopters are acquired in 1974. And a lot of this is in the context of the Vietnam War and essentially buying hardware from military subcontractors and then using them in domestic policing. So um, you have this use of this literal military hardware, and it's also combined with a vision of professionalization of the police. Uh, so William Parker's vision uh, played an important role in this. While Chief Parker's vision of professionalization in the post-war years laid the foundation for this approach, under the auspices of the Reagan era's intensified wars on crime, drugs, and gangs, the martial imperative grew stronger and received large increases in funding, especially through expanding asset forfeiture and the direct support from municipal, state, and federal governments. According to the Los Angeles Civil Liberties Union, the, quote, the political rhetoric about a war on drugs and a war on crime helped turn the police into soldiers, not civil servants or guardians of the community order, making them sometimes more aggressive and forceful than they have a right to be in pursuit of criminals and suspects. So one of the things I think is important about this is this militarization of police, but that it's also combined with these extractive practices like asset forfeiture. So they're both being funded by the state, but the state also develops an interest essentially in seizing of property. So I think to try to look at uh, what's going on in Los Angeles in this period, it's violence against people and also extraction of money and resources, that those two things go hand in hand. Los Angeles' high-profile war on drugs reflected the larger policies and strategic aims of Reagan's national punishment campaign, including saturation policing, eradication of youth gangs, asset forfeiture, federalization of drug charges, and the strict enforcement of mandatory minimum sentencing. At the street level, use of massive police sweeps with spectacular displays of overwhelming force embodied the city's militarized vision of law enforcement as to Chief, Ga Chief Gates's repeated call to arms. Testifying on the one-year anniversary of the George H.W. Bush administration's war on drugs, the LAPD chief told the Senate Judiciary Committee that, quote, the, the casual drug user ought to be taken out and shot. So um, I think one of the striking things, and this is an important point about the crack epidemic, is that long before crack was covered in the newspapers or was talked about. Chief Daryl Gates already had a plan for essentially mass incarceration. Tellingly, in 1980, prior to the advent of the alleged crack epidemic and Reagan's declaration of a new war on drugs, Chief Gates argued that 0.01% incarceration rate for California's population, at that time 26,000 people, was insufficient. To achieve greater public safety, he advocated between 2 and 3% of California's residents should be locked up. So that periodization is really important, that there's already this policy agenda for complete suppression and incarceration that predates the crack crisis itself. But in hindsight, the two of them were in many ways were lumped together. So I think that that, um, that is quite striking. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Um, I want to make sure to talk about the war on gangs. So one of the things about the war on drugs that makes it complicated to research is that a lot of the war on gangs was, was essentially fought through, I'm sorry, one of the things that makes it hard to research the war on drugs is that a lot of it, it's not an accident I made that slip, so much of it was fought through the war on gangs and also the war on terrorism. So those are overlapping discourses that are used and the declaration of people involved in an informal economy as street terrorists was a common term at the time. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the war on gangs the war on terror and the war on drugs that predates even 9-11. But I think uh, in thinking about where Los Angeles fits into this national history, its development of the war on gangs is perhaps the most important. 
So one of the new technologies of incarceration that's created in LA is the gang injunction, which is first, the first one is issued in 1982. And it was against um, essentially a group of youth that had spray painted um, a wall. And it was the pretext of this was to prosecute people through civil injunctions where you had less of a requirement of evidence. So the idea is what happens when a wall is spray painted. So the civil injunction was developed by James Hahn, and then it's later, um, uh, he and Ira Reiner later expand its use in the late 1980s. But essentially what the gang injunction did is that it, it specified a, sp a particular geographical area, and it stripped people who were included within the list of people um, in the gang injun injunction of their civil liberties. So things like wearing red shoelaces, waving at a car, um, uh, the right of association, spending time with your friends, all of that was designated as illegal and people could be prosecuted for it through a civil injunction. One of the most frightening things about the war on gangs is that there was a conscious recognition on the part of the prosecutors that they chose to do it through civil injunction because people were not required to receive uh, lawyers. So I think the gang injunction, there are now roughly, I don't know, between 130 and 150 different gang injunctions in Los Angeles. And what this does is it creates a map where people are not able to move outside certain neighborhoods without violating the terms of the gang injunction. So there are many different elements of the war on drugs, but the, those statistics that I cited, those are statistics from the LASD that designated 47% of African-American male youth between, I think it was uh, 19 and 24, as gang members. Those are the police's own statistics. Um, those in some ways are contested because the uh, law enforcement in LA also had their own benefit from exaggerating the numbers of gang members. But this complete elision between gang member and um, informal economy is one of the marks of the, the war on drugs in the 1980s and 1990s. So this is also, if we think about the election, uh, with Hillary Clinton recently and that quote from her about super predators, all of this is hearkening back to this history where you have essentially a war on drugs largely being prosecuted through a war on gangs, which becomes this all-out war on black and brown youth. Um, so in many ways, the LA story is a brutal and a difficult one, but just as uh, you see these new technologies uh, used against youth, you also see new forms of mobilization. And one of the reasons I chose to write about Los Angeles is that I knew, also from being a Panther historian, that where you find the greatest repression, you're also going to see some of the greatest resistance. And what we saw in Los Angeles, first of all, was the 1992 rebellion, which in many ways I think was a partially class and race-based revolt against this incredibly repressive order. And it also expressed an immense anger at the police, you know, structural police violence, criminalization of the wars on drugs and the wars on gangs. And it's after 1992 that we begin to see a shift. So it, it's apparent that the real effect of the war on drugs is this mass criminalization of young people. And precisely what, you know, what residents were trying to protect their children from, they find them being in the crosshairs of the state and criminalized. So we begin to see a new kind of organizing after 92, and it's led importantly by Michael Zinzin, who was a member of the Pasadena chapter of the Black Panther Party. And they'd been working quietly, trying to fight incarceration for a long time and won these key victories against the LAPD in the 1980s. Um, ultimately, this really reaches its apex in 1996 when you had the Gary Webb Dark Alliance series, which created mass protests in Los Angeles. The protests were so large that the director of the CIA at the time, John Deutsch, was forced to come and speak to uh, high school in Watts and other parts of South LA. So that concession to protest in Los Angeles showed the level of mobilization. So I think that it's important when we're thinking about mass incarceration, to both to look at the structures of violence, incarceration, and criminalization, but also of the creativity of response. And what we began to see in the 1980s was a mobilization of young people, the formerly incarcerated, um, mothers of incarcerated children uh, who formed an important, um, who played a very important role, role in the gang truce after the LA rebellion. So I'd say that Los Angeles is an instructive case, not only for thinking about police militarization, but also how groups of people came together to fight it. Thank you.
Thank I you. was told to um, operate like a, uh, not like a political scientist, but like a, a humanitarian, uh, uh, a humanist um, in keeping time. So uh, <laughs> we went a little bit over, but that's okay. So now we're here from Julie Kohler Houseman. Does it cause problems if I stay here for anybody? Um, I just am convinced I will knock that computer off of the thing with my like hand motions. Now I'm just gonna hit you guys, but I won't like be charged with any, uh, <laughs> like ho hopefully you won't <laughs> charge me. Um, so I, um, I am so thrilled and honored to be part of this, this gathering. Um, and I'm and I'm really thankful for the folks here at Hopkins for pulling it together and for Nathan for including me. Um, I'm like a especially super triple honored to be with this <laughs> lineup of women. When I got the program, I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I was like, this is just uh, this, these women, all of whom I've admired for a very long time. Um, so I, I'm, I'm so I'm grateful. Um, I am grateful, but I actually really struggled with how to with my comments today to sort of because um, I've thought a lot about the, con the the question of rehabilitation. I've struggled with it a lot. And um, and I I worked on a book for a longer time than I want to <laughs> spell out right now that just came out recently that was that traces um, this the way that uh, rehabilitation became supplanted with a punishment um, in these key fights in welfare policy and crime policy and um, criminal sentencing policy during the 1970s and so um, so what I wanted to do today is sort of tell a part of one of those stories. Um, conveniently, we're gonna have like California-themed day, although I'm gonna <laughs> backtrack a little bit um, and try to hopefully see, you know, sort of pull out some points from that story that I, th that I hope will inform our sort of broader discussions about um, that, that have already been going on. Um, but my point is actually pretty simple, uh, which is that I think that this history serves as a stark warning about the perils of framing our conversations about crime and punishment, I mean about crime in terms of um, cr of rehabilitation and punishment. That, that sort of having our conversations focus around this binary. Um, and, I, and I particularly sort of want to sort of challenge the trend I think which I don't think is really happening I don't think is happening in I think the kind of preaching the converted here but definitely circulating in popular discourse about you know about folks who are tr which is this tendency to be like we need to go back to the era when rehabilitate when our prisons were rehabilitative sort of this like return to the sort of glory days of the US penal system um so I'm hoping that this story will sort of help crystallize some of the reasons why that is maybe not the sort of political project we want um, that, that maybe folks want to embrace. So I forgot to start my time. Let's see, so, so non-political <laughs> so so <laughs> so non sciencey of me. Okay, so um, so when I started this research, it, uh, you see, you still hear this, there was this tendency to sort of, t to, to narrate the rise of, mis of mass incarceration with the fall of the rehabilitative ideal in the 1970s, you know, which is sort of located as something that happens in the 1970s. So when I started the research, I wanted to set out to sort of find the historical process that, you know, like how, how did this happen? So what's the, um, what's the, what's the story of this, the, 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 the fall of this, of the of faith in the idea that prisons should be dedicated to reforming people? Um, and what I decided to do is I actually focused on, again, like I said, California and this, and this, um, law that was passed in 1976, which was the first major um, sentencing law in, that abandoned what was, was indeterminate sentencing and embraced fixed sentencing in, um, and, and, and I'll talk, I'll define indeterminate sentencing, don't worry for those of you who are, don't have the pleasure to know about it, but, um, but th this, this 76 law is, is sort of ends up being pretty famous. It famously says, in the actual sort of purpose of the law, that the purpose of inc of, in of incar imprisonment for crime is punishment. So it's really this sort of forthright declaration of the abandonment of this sort of rehabilitative project. Um, now, so the indeterminate sentence had been the central pillar of penal practice for half a century, and it really was the embodiment of this rehabilitative ideal. The way that it worked in practice was that actually judges did not control the amount of time people spent in prison. It was act so a judge upon sentencing would say, "Sorry, I always have like an imaginary person that's going to be like you're going to you're going to serve your sentence is three years to life." Okay, like a true indeterminate sentence is one year to life. Just like and the and the 
and it's actually the, the parole board that controls the length of sentencing. So then you, you appear before the parole board every year and they sort of assess if you're rehabilitated enough to be released. The thinking uh, is, in a sort of pure rehabil like hypothetically, you could upon day two of your, you know, like the day of your first parole board hearing be deemed like sufficiently reformed and, and released. You also could hypothetically be incarcerated until death, you know, with, with these, um, for the ones that, for the sentences that go till death. Um, so, so, w so when I went in to, to sort of start doing this research about like how did this unravel, what happened, um, the interesting thing about, first thing that's interesting about California is that place where it unravels is the place where it was actually the most developed. People, California sort of rehabilitative programs were the kind of, um, were really the, the, the high bar um, that, that people would look to nationally. Um, the second thing that I, you know, which, which I sort of had a sense of, but it's, kind of, you can say it's ironic, but I don't think that's quite right, that, that this, this promise that prisons are intended to rehabilitate and make, you know, and sort of re bring people into citizenship, that, that this promise coexisted with a stark commitment to racial hierarchy, both obviously within society, but definitely within the prison. Um, and secondly, with the practice of what's called civil death, um, which is the idea that upon, you know, that, that that when someone commits a crime, they break the social contract and they forfeit their stat, you know, they actually forfeit their claims on rights. So like sort of felon disenfranchisement, for instance, is premised on this notion of civil death. Um, so the idea that on one hand, I mean, so some people talk about this as, a, as an irony, right? With like you've got one hand a program that's, the, a prison that's dedicated to making, to sort of facilitating um, reintegration into society and at the same time, You've got a, a sort of explicit practice which says that when people become c convicts, they s sort of cease to have civic standing in the c in the country, uh, in the polity. So I kind of came to believe that these things really shouldn't be considered actually dichotomous, and that really they all sort of worked together to position um, groups of people in really degraded civic statuses in the w you know within the co within the polity. Um, so. So how did so how did indeterminate sent how did this indeterminate sentencing get replaced and sort of and this is like sort of how the fall of this of the rehabilitative ideal sort of happens in California? Um, there'd always been critics of indeterminate sentencing on the right. People th there'd always been people saying this was coddling this was coddling prisoners. Um, it, and it interestingly was actually intensified scrutiny and criticism from the left during the 1960s and 70s that was really a key part of triggering uh, the program's demise. So the standard standard story um, is what is it standard the standard story, the standard story. <laughs> sorry the standard story yeah the standard story is that. Um, is that there were a bunch of like people wrote a bunch of treaties and a bunch of books and there's a bunch of reports that showed that um, that, that either that cr that both critique the system but the, the sort of classic one is that a bunch of sociologists like went out and they ran the numbers and they f they did all these studies on rehabilitative programs and they're like oh we're spending all this money and look at recidivism rates and crime still happening so it looks like rehabilitation doesn't work and so that you know there's a study that says rehabilitation doesn't work and then that and so people give out the ghost and that's that's sort of one of these classic stories um, there's parts of that story that uh, that happened to, to some degree but the story that I want to sort of say today is that what I think the California case shows is that actually prisoners themselves were instrumental in discrediting this um, this project the indeterminate the, the indeterminate sentence and the and the and the rehabilitative ideal sort of broadly um, that their critiques about the sort of normalization that happened through the th through the indeterminate sentence was like very powerful in shaping broader social critiques that people were really picking up with and in dialogue um, with incarcerated writers and incarcerated activists. Uh, secondly, through their activism, resistance, and you know, straight up insurgency within prisons, they actually made the rehabilitative the, the, the indeterminate sentence an increasingly ineffective tool for managing prisons, which is really what I think to a large degree it was. It was a way of ha of, man of keeping kind of control um, within within prisons. Um, and thirdly, when this was this did this was surprising to me that actually pr prisoners. <laughs> Um, were directly involved in the actual legislative process of replacing um, of uh, of replacing these laws. Not always in the way they want to be clear. You know, they wanted to be clear, but they were you know they were really directly in dialogue. You know, some not all directly in dialogue with legislators. So that they were really like front and center in, in this story, and not in a way that had been you know that that I thought had been, had been addressed. So prisoners hated the inter indeterminate sentence, and I like. I've tried to find 
exceptions to that, um, but it's sort of overwhelmingly true. Um, one wrote, uh, this is just, uh, I'm not going to give you lots of, but there's some incredible quotes, but one, one, perso one person wrote, parole boards are, and this is an indeterminate sentence, the sort of manifestation of that in people's lives is the parole board, right, is the person you're appearing in front of. Um, Parole boards are the most sophisticated, non-judicial, arbitrary, paternalistic, arrogant, abusive, inhumane, insensitive, manipulative, bureaucratic, red tape, I'm not done, double-talking, <laughs> bullying administrative body that sits in judgment over human beings. Um, and now a quick description of how it worked, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, sort of illustrates why it was so hated. So, the, you know, so, so, so someone would, you come before your parole board after you serve a minimum percentage of your, of your, of your sentence, and whether or not you're freed or not depends on a seven, you know, an interview that lasts between seven and ten minutes on average during this period. Um, the, the, interview, the, the decision is based on your file, which you have no access to, so that file can have, um, like, memos from from any, you know, from like psychiatrists, from like d district attorneys, from other, potentially other prisoners, certainly from guards. There, there's like, there's a lot of consternation about silent beefs. You just would not, you had no access to what actually got into that file and you couldn't sort of like appeal to see what was the basis of the decision. Parole boards don't have to explain why they made the decisions that they do. Um, and there's, I mean, it does, it's not surprising that this creates an incredible amount of uncertainty, hostility, um, and and un, and and unrest within, um, uh, with you know within the population, incarcerated population. And there's really this sense, and a lot of people talk about this, that the people that served the longest sentences weren't necessarily the worst criminals, but they were the worst inmates, right? They were the people who were the most, who were the least apt at navigating the institution. They were the activists. They were the writ writers. Like, these are the people who ended up actually serving the longer, the longer sentence. So that was like a, th that was an intense source of frustration. Um, but one of the things is that, that people talked about a lot, and there's a lot of criticism during the period, is that prisoners found the ind indeterminate sentence to be in a particularly um, oppressive form of punishment. And by the way, they often called it, it is punishment. It's not, I mean, they, they would deliberately s like kind of blur this sort of stark punishment rehabilitative boundary and say it's a form of punishment because it would force them to perform dominant notions of rehabilitation in a way to get, to, like, to get free. So critics charged that parole boards found, you know, like obviously found the performance of rehabilitation much more convincing if it was a sort of middle class performance or if it was a white person, you know, like these, that, that there were a whole host of ways where you could, certain populations were much more, like had much more access to the performance of rehabilitation. Um, there's one woman explained, and I and I uh, I, I want to say I think it's sort of a side note. It's really interesting that do you hear these criticisms, these critiques from um, by incarcerated people, and the way that they really prefigure, I think, some of Foucault's critiques of disciplinary regimes. But that's sort of a um, a side note. But this one woman wrote. She wrote, "Sisters in prison tend to play a role when the pressure's on, or to superficially pretty herself when all the time she's being geared towards rehabilitation, breaking the sister into society's role, passive, brainless, and obedient. For our brothers, they encourage to do the same way, only to be programmed to fit his predefined role as a man in society. So by doing this, our brothers and sisters, the prison's officials are attempting to mold them into submissive subjects." of society. Um, so there were many, again, there's no like single prisoner voice. You know, obviously people had many, many different interpretations of this. Many um, sort of, of um, some many radical activists sort of rejected the entire premise of rehabilitation, um, particularly the way that the sort of rehabilitative project individualizes crime, right? The idea, I mean, obviously when, you, when, you, when you're responding to crime through through rehabilitation, the understanding of it is this, the locus is in, you know, is, is in the individual. Um, Others, uh, others maybe accepted, you know, thought that maybe prisons should be rehabilitative or definitely thought that there should be services, for instance, available, but they were like very opposed to the coercive manner in which the program, you know, which these things were um, executed. So the ways that freedoms or rights or privileges within the institution was contingent upon acting out the state's vision of rehabilitation. So the way in which rehabilitation was actually a tool of control within, you know, became a tool of control within the institution. Um, so. The, the, the policy had been po unpopular for a long time, and I think it was really um, social move, you know, the, the social movements uh, and, and prisoner, and it's sort of in increasing, there'd always, of course, been sort of re resistance within prisons, too, but increasingly, um, 
uh, visible social movements by by incarcerated people and outside um, that that were intimately in, intertwined with the Black Freedom Movement that really pushed the, a lot of these critiques out forward. And Dan Berger is in the audience, and his his work on this on the actual social movements is really critical and and, and important. Um, but there was during this period there was widespread there were there were general strikes within these prisons there was the prisons according to prison officials they were finding the prisons increasingly unmanageable there was what you know there were um open re rebellions active organizing and over and over again the the indeterminate sentence and the rehabilitative ideal was either just sort of a direct target of opposition or it became um, actually understood as um, emblematic of what's the broader problems or sort of a representative of the bro broader problems within the, the prison system so um, so increasingly prison administrators were less even though it had been this very important powerful tool of of, of control within the institution and um, and people were, I think people were genuinely committed to it sort of ideologically to some extent. Um, some, some people were. Uh, it became the, the, the sort of, the, the, the rebellions within prisons made the prison administrators more and more willing to be like, you know what, let's trade this, to, you know, this might actually be a source of disorder as opposed to like a, something that's actually causing order. And they're more and more willing to, 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 to change the uh, sentencing policies. And so this is, and, and it's from this that the actual laws get forwarded that actually abolish the indeterminate sentence. And what's fascinating about this time, and I'm gonna, I am wrapping up, I just got right to here. Um, I'm like, see? <laughs> um, the, is that for this moment, prisoners' support of abolishing the indeterminate sentence was actually viewed as like a plus in the in this policy, which is kind of unthinkable in our today's political climate. You would never be like, we've got some great sentencing for reforms, and guess what? Incarcerated people really want it too. People would be like, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. but what what um, but in this law, they actually brought in like nine boxes of letters from people who, uh, from incarcerated people and their families, and to show how much. And it was a Republican legislator who brought in these nine boxes to say this is like this how much these people want to be out from underneath this 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 system. Um, so prisoners were actually instrumental in discrediting and destabilizing this system, but they were eventually locked out. Um, uh, of, from being participants in, in what replaced it and the sort of struggles about moving forward. I actually think those are separate stories, um, and that's chapter six, and I'm not, <laughs> um, I'm not gonna do that, but I, I, but all of this is simply to bring attention to the fact that in practice, at, at least in this, in this historical example, um, these rehabilitative projects became instruments of control, of normalization, of um, a strategy of pacification, and they were therefore really unstable because they were in inherently confronted resistance from the people that were subject, you know, that were subjected to them. Um, none of this is to s and not suggesting there shouldn't be services or programming within prisons, but to re re really to resist this temptation to idealize this golden era <laughs> of rehabilitation, you know, pre um, and and to question this very strong rupture, you know, that we sort of make between mass incarceration and this earlier um, period. So. And the last thing I want to say as I wrap up is that to just bring attention again to what I gestured to in the beginning, which is the danger of framing debates of pun as punishment versus rehabilitation, um, and the way in which this really constricts the terms of of, of the debate. Um, and what I'm and I'm, I'm not going to get into this much right, right now, but I, what I think we need to recognize is that punishment and rehabilitation aren't binaries, right? They're not mutually exclusive. They actually historically coexist. There's, you know, I mean, they they often blur, especially for people who are sort of dealing with experiencing both that, that I don't think we should think about we uh, our history as like oh we had an era of rehabilitation and now we have an era of punishment because um, I think the struggle has really always been who are the ca appropriate candidates for rehabilitation who is a valuable candidate for inclusion who are the peer you know who are the people um, stop that. um so, so you you actually um, that it's really, and, and race has always been the stark, you know, the stark line in those debates, but there's, even at the sort of high mark of the rehabilitative ideal, there were always people in populations that were, that were staunchly, um, the line was staunchly drawn. So, um, so that, to, so to conclude, basically, we just need to remember that both are strategies that, act, that aim the intervention at the level of the individual, and um, and that when we lock into that frame, a whole host of interventions are sort of immediately off the table, and a whole host of understandings um, of our of our situation are immediately off the table. So, thank you.
now we'll hear from Talitha. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers and sponsors of this wonderful conference for um, inviting me to participate in this timely and critical discussion. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about rehabilitation at all, but actually the failures of rehabilitation, particularly at the um, Fluvanna Correctional Facility for Women. And I'm going to talk um, about how um, my new research on the medical lives of incarcerated black women has resulted in the creation of experiential learning opportunities and engagements with students at the University of Virginia. Um, my scholarship focuses on the lived and laboring experiences of working class incarcerated black women. Um, generally speaking, I'm interested in understanding how the state commodifies black female bodies. In my first book, Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South, I examine how penal regimes in the post-Civil War South, primarily in the state of Georgia, um, extracted wealth from the labor of female prisoners who were forced to work on railroads, um, in brickyards, lumber mills, chain gangs, sawmills, mines, um, plantations, um, and in turpentine camps. Um, I show how these women literally and figuratively rebuilt the war-torn South along with men amidst threat of physical and sexual violence, as well as medical exploitation. Throughout the course of my research on my first book, um, I found that women were exposed to severe forms of medical mistreatment and neglect. Um, one of the most impactful and illuminating examples of this can be found in the case of Ella Gamble. And um, Ella Gamble's application for clemency that you see here um, is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna read uh, in her words, essentially, how she experienced incarceration um, at the state prison farm in Georgia. And it really, in many ways, um, illustrates the extent of medical abuse that she experienced there. And then I want to talk about this contemporary problem that we have and looking at the failure um, of the prison health care um, industry. And, and I arguably believe that, in many ways, incarcerated sick people um, function as commodities. And there isn't necessarily an investment in curing or are um, making them well. So Ella Gamble, um, in 1884, um, she was a 22-year-old pregnant newlywed mother and domestic worker, but she was convicted of murder. Um, she was accused of murdering her employer by poisoning him um, by putting rough on rats, which was a popular form of rodenticide in his food. And she was sentenced to serve um, life imprisonment in the Georgia State Penitentiary System. From the point of her incarceration in 1884 until the date of her release 20 years later, she passed through five prison camps. Um, her last stop was the state prison farm uh, where she spent the remaining months of her life dying from cancer and begging to be free. And these were some of her last words. Quote, Judge Turner, kind sir, I write you and humbly beg you to please send me home. I've been down sick in bed 12 months today, Judge. I don't feel like I will be here on earth very long. I don't want to die here in prison, and I beg you to please, Judge, for the sake of my poor father who is lying in his grave and my mother and brother and sister who is watching and waiting on you to send me home so I can see their faces. Judge, I am no service to myself and neither, neither to the state. Judge, please have mercy on me and grant me one kind favor in sending me home, for I has cancer in my bowels. Some weeks I bleed near, uh, very near to death. Judge, please pity me and let me go home. Ella Gamble's plea um, is what encouraged me to pursue a deeper investigation of the role medical abuse plays in the lives of imprisoned black women today. I am drawn to the study of gender medicine and mass incarceration because I feel that, um, and I find that incarcerated black women are consistently ignored and excluded from conversations about America's prison problem. Mass incarceration is an epidemic that disproportionately affects black women. Black women represent 30% of all imprisoned women in the US, although they make up only 13% of the general female population. 
Sentencing disparities for violent and nonviolent drug-related offenses have made African-American women three times more likely to go to prison than white women. And during the height of the war on drugs, these numbers were much higher, around six or seven to one. Um, black women also continue to receive longer senten prison sentences than their white counterparts, and they are overrepresented in solitary confinement uh, numbers as well. My interest in understanding uh, the crisis in correctional health care and its impact on black women led me to develop a race medicine and incarceration class on which I'm currently teaching. This was my way of exercising activism in the classroom and partnering with students on research projects that placed them in conversation with the public and in relationship with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. At the, begin at the beginning of the semester, um, I actually offered uh, the students an opportunity to devise individual or group projects centered around some aspect of the course theme. There were no set criteria for the types of projects they could do, um, but what they came up with was pretty impressive and inspiring. And so I'll share um, some of the work that they're, that they're doing, which I think is, is wonderful. The Fluvana Project, um, which is facilitated by three student researchers under my supervision, was developed um, as a way to serve incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women from the Fluvana Correctional Facility in Troy, Virginia, which is about maybe 20 miles um, outside of Charlottesville. And here's a picture of the facility here. By collecting these women's stories um, through oral interviews and by interning at the Legal Aid Justice Center in Charlottesville. Um, we thought it important to work with imprisoned individuals at FCCW for a number of reasons. First, we wanted to acknowledge, that, uh, acknowledge the voices and perspectives of this marginalized population. Uh, second, we selected this site because of its prominence in the region. FCCW is viewed as a, quote, leader in providing mental health and medical services for, uh, to female patients. But in actuality, it's a dumping ground for sick, low-income minority women, majority of whom are black, and from the Hampton Roads area. Fluvana houses roughly 1,200 prisoners, making up around 40% of um, the women prisoners in the state of Virginia. Women housed at this prison suffer with ailments such as diabetes, hepatitis, AIDS, cancer, heart disease, and a host of other illnesses. Their testimonies, much like Ella Gamble's, reveal years of medical abuse, neglect, and horrific treatment. Um, on September the 6th, 2017, uh, Fluvana made national headlines. The Washington Post covered a story about several female inmates who died this year alone um, or were subjected to harmful medical procedures, including the woman that you see pictured here, Sherry Richburg. In July, two women uh, died at Fluvana, 70-year-old Carolyn Liberto, who was serving um, time in a murder case, and 38-year-old Deanna Neese, who had convictions for forgery and probation violations. As stated in the Washington Post article, Liberto suffered from hypertension and had a history of congestive heart failure. Before she died of cardiopulmonary failure on July 21st, her medication reportedly ran out and she was never referred to a specialist for her extremely high blood pressure. The day before her death, Liberto complained of chest pain and was told by a medical staffer that her vitals were fine and that she should return to her cell. That night, Liberto began complaining that she could not breathe. And emergency oxygen was not available, according to the plaintiffs, which were other incarcerated women who witnessed her demise. She died overnight. Niece, who had multi multiple sclerosis, complained of shortness of breath and chest pain throughout the day and had trouble walking, according to the court filing. That night, she began to convulse, vomit, and cough up blood. There was no suction equipment readily available, and oxygen had to be brought from another building. She died. There was something wrong with her all day, and none of the nurses she talked to bothered to follow up with her or send her to medical, inmate Rachel McCracken wrote in an affidavit. Then she died on the floor, only a couple of weeks before she would have been free. Former inmate Sherry Richburg, who you see pictured here, 
wrote in an affidavit that inconsistent access to antibiotics during her two-year incarceration at Fluvana caused her severe pain and forced her to have a femur transplant in her leg replaced with cement. They put cement in her leg. She lost 40 pounds from infection and the cement shattered when she fell trying to go to the bathroom. After her release this year, Richburg's leg was amputated to her hip. Sorry. Um, I was punished for my crime and I did my time, Richburg said in an affidavit. But Fluvana punished me a second time when the medical staff did not take care of me. Um, in July 2012, a group of five women in prison at FCCW filed a lawsuit against the Virginia Department of Corrections in order to, quote, remedy the failure of FCCW on a systematic, pervasive, and ongoing basis to provide the stu uh, residents with medical care sufficient, either in nature or in extent, to satisfy the minimum standards mandated by the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So two students in the Fluvana Project, um, which we devised, um, the research group, and my race medicine incarceration class have begun locating former inmates and conducting interviews. A third student is serving as an intern at the Legal Aid Justice Center who's defending um, this group of women um, who are very bravely, um, you know, raising charges against um, the facility. She's actually working on the Scott versus Clark case, and um, as part of her internship, she'll be conducting interviews with incarcerated women who continue to face neglect at um, Fluvana. She'll also be responsible for documenting cases that demonstrate the failure to uphold the 2014 settlement um, agreement by studying grievance, grievance reports and medical records, which are not um, open for public use now, but um, next year, once they are, um, we'll have access to them and we'll be able to begin to start publishing from them. And we're also in the process of trying to create like a digital archive um, and vid video recording women's interviews and making that accessible. Because one of the things that these women want they want to be heard. And I think that the panel that was shared um, before our panel, one of the things that has been stated over and over and over again um, incar by incarcerated people and incarcerated women is that they want their voices heard. They want their perspectives understood. And that's why my first book, the reason why I entitled it Chained in Silence is because I felt that for so many years and for centuries, incarcerated black women in the post-Civil War context have been silenced. But even today, you know, black women, you know, they're essentially their voices are not heard and they're essentially drowned out amid the deafening defense of black manhood. So this in many ways is my way of, you know, presenting some sort of corrective measure to this male-centric um, rendering of these histories, but also the present day experiences of incarcerated women who are completely elided in public discourse and in the scholarship. Beyond this um, research collaborative, there are other ways my students are emancipating the humanities. Two students have uh, partnered with the UVA Drama Department, and um, this is fun. I'm going to make it light now because it just get you know, it's, it's just dark stuff. You know, it's, everybody's called to do a different kind of scholarship. Like, I'm just, you know, a champion for the dispossessed, and I'm like a subaltern you know, studies person. So that's just my particular calling. But I do have a silver lining in this in this narrative. Um, two students have partnered with the UVA Drama Department, and they're actually planning a um, silenced but speaking showcase where they'll be performing pieces adapted from The Fire Inside, um, which was a zine published by the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Um, they're using this performance to speak to the lived experiences of incarcerated women and to acknowledge how art has um, proven to be an invaluable lifeline and creative outlet for the oppressed. And they came up that, with that on their own. They actually sent me a blurb about their project. So I'm sure that they would be really happy to know that um, I'm reading it. Another group of students developed a curriculum um, for the Blue Ridge Juvenile Detention Center in Charlottesville and have been approved to lead a seminar with incarcerated youth. Um, some of the topics they plan to address include bullying, um, safety and privacy, um, sexuality-related issues, uh, pregnancy, uh, STD prevention. And what they told me they wanted to do was to not necessarily function as mentors but as trustworthy peers because they're young and because the youth can relate to them and they want to essentially 
um, find ways to communicate with these young people to get them to communicate to them what their needs are so that they can serve as a conduit to the authorities to help, you know, improve conditions or to help them to feel safer in that environment. So this is some really subversive work, you know, that they're doing. And I just wanted to share, um, you know, on the failures of rehabilitation, but how emancipating the humanities can function as an important way of, you know, re us forcing rehabilitative and subversive by subversive means by using the classroom as a space to do that. So um, that's the extent of my remarks. Well, thank you to to really wide ranging, very powerful uh, group of papers and remarks. So um, we have time. Let's open it up for conversation and, and comments and ideas. Please. Do you want to say? Hi, thank you all. Um, my name is Chelsea Lakima Payman. I am a student at Morgan, and I just have a question for you all about, um, I guess if you could like trace how the public has thought about rehabilitation and incarceration, because nowadays particularly, I'm finding that people don't even think of being imprisoned as being punished. People are thinking of it as like welfare. So like, oh, those prisoners get free food, and like they aren't being punished, and that like, when we talk about things like neglect and peop and prisoners' um, resistance against being oppressed, how people say that like that is a punishment. So like having your leg cut off in jail because you're being neglected, like that is the actual punishment for the crime and not being incarcerated. Um, and so I was just wondering if you all could like trace that transformation in people's opinions about imprisonment. Um, I was just say very quickly, I don't think prison has ever been intended to rehabilitate or reform. Um, and I think that that whole rehabilitation ideology was just essentially used as a smokescreen to find ways to capitalize off of people's bodies because prisoners have always been capital commodities from, you know, the post-Civil War period to the present. So, um, this whole notion that, you know, the prison is a playground and is basically, you know, a place where people go and lift weights and, you know, watch um, BET and, um, you know, get three three meals in a cot, like all of this kind of um, this rhetoric, you know, we hear it, but um, I don't think that enough of the public really understands that prisons are designed to punish, not to rehabilitate. So. Yeah, and I think that was the case during the high, you know, when people were still really championing that rhetoric too, you know, to a degree. But the, um, to, to, I mean, the the thing that strikes me with those dialogue, those debates so much is how much it depends on this, this understanding of civil death that I was mentioning. This idea that like, after you've br after y once once you've sort of broken this pr contract, it's suddenly that like the fact that you would be able to claim medical care. <laughs> is 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 this sort of profound shock to you know what I mean like a front which is which is such a I mean I think it actually sort of speaks to the sort of weakness of our of the whole of our whole nation sort of sense of civic and social rights you know that like how 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 little how many of our claims to for instance medical care are contingent upon like well I work so therefore I deserve medical care I pay taxes so therefore I deserve I mean there's this sense that there's a claim like a you know that there's a broad claim to to, to you know to th to to medical care or to um you know to to sustenance or to you know to, to not i mean like that's so weak in our society you know it's so weak generally in society that like that, that, that and then the and then you move on to uh, from there this to the fact that this how powerful the understanding is that once that people have forfeit every claim on the state upon being um, up, upon being convicted I mean that's really what sort of has always struck me about that about that discourse is just the idea that it, it, it and I think that's very I'm not sure that that's I think that's gotten more intense but I think that's a pretty long I mean I guess this is what you were saying I think that's a pretty deep history I'm not sure that that's a post you know like last 10 year story but I don't know if Donna <laughs> Um, yeah, I agree with both things my colleagues have said. 
I think that, you know, part of what you're describing is the politics of resentment, which is so alive and powerful right now in so many different forms. So speaking to what um, Jalili was saying about how weak our own social contract is. So whether it's the military or the prison, we have people seeing it as a form of social welfare, and that speaks to the size of the punishment state in the United States, as well as the particular demonization. I think that the creation in different historical periods of these demonologies of prisoners, which obscure the actual violence of the state, so the question I would ask, though, is like, is it always the same? Because I do think that, you know, one thing that happened in the Clinton administration with the stripping of Pell Grants, right, like the taking away of funding for um, public, you know, for higher education within prisons or, um, you know, in the Reagan administration and then codified under the Clinton administration of making it impossible once people come out of prison to live in public housing. Mm -hmm. So I think we can talk, I would want to talk about it also in terms of intensification because I do think that rehabilitation, that kind of progressive era ideal in California, I learned about it through my first book in the Panthers. And one of the things that you see is that as the demographics of California change, so too does the implementation of the progressive ideal. So I do think it actually changes over time. It was always imperfect. It was always a form of commodifying and punishing human beings. But you do begin to see the social welfare as aspects stripped away. You have... Um, uh, Chief Parker in the LAPD talking in the 40s and 50s at the height of black migration, we are not social workers. Mm -hmm. Which is not to say the police were ever social workers, but you know, there is an explicit repudiation of any form of you know, treating people as citizens. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's, you know, your question is a wonderful one and it's also an empirical one, I think, is to begin to talk about attitudes. But I just, one of the things I just, it makes me think about the 1980s and how we couldn't see mass incarceration because all we were seeing through some kind of, ver some kind of, I don't wanna use the word collusion, <laughs> through some kind of, you know, through both the state and through popular media mm -hmm. was a focus on the people themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Uh, hi, my name's Quinn. I'm from Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm really struck by each of the papers how you're describing kind of spectacular moments of violence and punishment that really go beyond thinking of the prison as a site where the like, go beyond thinking of the of prison violence as about isolation or containment. So we have like extreme medical abuse, like militarized police, the violence of the law itself and how it's applied. So I wonder if you could say more about the kind of logics of punishment they are identifying that certainly are at work inside the prison as a institution, but really don't rely, but really like spread beyond it and like spread their tendrils throughout kind of society as a whole. If that makes sense. Um, I don't. Uh, <laughs> um, tell me, say a little bit more about what. You, uh, what you mean, I'm always the worst question answer because I'm like, <laughs> just want to return the question <laughs> and ask more questions of you. T tell me more about what you mean uh, w by, um, sp by what spreading the tendrils, that, that the last part. That's what I, I want to know. What um, I, I want to answer the part that you're. Yeah, so I guess like a conventional image of like why prisons are violent is they're isolating, right? So someone wouldn't say focus on medical abuse because that seems so outside of that image of like, so, um, solitary confinement or something like that. But I think each of you are identifying kind of places where the logic of prison really entangles with spaces that aren't the prison, like uh, urban communities or um, the legal system, but as it's applied to prisons. So kind of thinking outside of the physical prison itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could give an example. Uh, which is something that I heard a lot when I was in Los Angeles when people were talking about the LA Rebellion. And uh, when people, you know, you had over 12,000 people that were arrested. And you saw the racialization inside prisons where you had, you know, guards in jails actively fomenting tension between black and brown incarcerated people. And in some cases, those spilled out you know, people were being jailed, most people ended up being released into the street. So people talk about some of the tensions between black and brown street organizations in the 1990s, and they trace some of that conflict back to, to, to essentially the jail and the prison system as a place of race making. And not only white supremacy versus people of color, but also particularly generating tension between, you know, uh, African Americans, uh, Chicanos, and Salvadorans. So I think some of that history of thinking about how jails relate to the streets. Uh, yeah. 
You don't, I, I didn't want to interrupt no, you, Virginia. I'm actually just still trying to understand the question. So, um, I mean, and it, no shade. I just um, don't fully know if I am interpreting your question um, correctly. So I don't know exactly how to apply my work to that question, but if I think of something in the next two minutes, I'll let you know. Oh, okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, Daniel in the back. Um, so I have a follow-up uh, from the first question that maybe resonates with the exchange we've had subsequently on the, on the next question. So, and it involves maybe linking uh, the, uh, I, would, I, I'm, I, draw, I appreciate the theme of, of civic death and the, the broader question of shifts in uh, popular sensibilities around what is the, the capacity of the state uh, where does it have power? Where is it figured to not have power? Where is it in decline in its relationship to the way we produce our the, the, the civic side of our subjectivities? And clearly the prison is, is, is a place where this is happening. And so I would like to, one place to link that, and I think this may speak to this question about isolations, and it may speak to the earlier theme of, you know, the different uh, forms of human and social life that are, we're because our view of these things are so impoverished broadly in, in the country, uh, we see this being produced and maybe intensified in the racialized carceral state. And so, for example, we link that to the idea of the discussion of uh, indeterminate sentencing. Right? One of the ways I understand the history of, 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 of indeterminate sentencing was to amplify state power and insulate it from populist sentiment. Right, so that the, the, the punitive populist sentiment, which one finds on the newspaper and in the court, uh, is insulated from the actual uh, administrative state through the parole system, right? So there was a, if you follow me, right, there was a sort of progressive ideal of an activist state that needed the indeterminate assisting system to insulate it from populist resentment and racial and populist resentment, um, right? So I think perhaps the decline, the withdrawal from that, this is not to, complicates this narrative, but I think it actually ultimately supports it, is that the withdrawal from that is also part of shifting ideas of the state's own decline and where it acts out, if you will. So um, anyway, I just thought I would I add that to the mix. Um, so I'll start if that's okay, just because it's... <laughs> um, okay. Um, so... Yes. Um, I've, I, I'm trying to like rein myself in because I have a, a lot of things that, that I could say about that. But I think that th that's absolutely a really important part of this story. And what, you know, I made the joke like, then there's chapter six, which was like, the you know, like how, how the story that I told sort of transfers into sort of what I think we kind of understand is the, the sort of rise of mass incarceration. Um, the acceleration of, 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 of mass incarceration that happens in the 1970s, which is basically a frenzy of punitive laws that are being passed in the 90s. So, so what happens when you take, I mean, so part of what the, the, of the fear of the, in, in, of the, the reason the indeterminate sentence, that that was part of it, was to shield, the, to shield sentencing from populist pressures. Part of that fear is borne out when indeterminate sentencing ends, right? Because you transfer, there is no penal system with no discretion, right? You're just moving around <laughs> where, the where the discretion is. So, you, so people were understandably had huge problems with the discretion, the way that it was operated at, through the parole board. But then when it gets moved from the parole board into, the state, into state legislatures, what you see, if any of them remember, I mean, California in the next decade will pass 1,000 laws increasing criminal sentences. 1,000 laws. It is a full on, or, I mean, it's just, a, it's an origin. I mean, it's, it's just, it's incredible. I mean, it's to the point where they're like, they, they, they jack up the sentences for rape one week and they literally come back and do it again like a, a month later. I mean, it's just out of, it, did I say <laughs> Did I say words? Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, I know. I was like, I was like, there's, I was like, the words are gonna come out and it's gonna be wrong here. But I was trying to capture like that it was. Uh, uh, can you turn that off? Um, yeah. So, so, and and so I think that there, there absolutely is, and and I, so so on a sort of empirical level, that's absolutely you know part of what was going on. But I also think that part of the yes, this is actually also a moment of like these policies are actually profound. They're they're anti status They're anti. They're the part of what makes this move um, resonant is it's a sort of rejection of expertise, right? I mean, it's it's not just a. Um, 
it's there's a lot of different chains that move into this this move but there's this feeling of like who are these penal you know who are these specialists that like are you know are sort of weighing and counting this is really tied up in kind of an anti you know there there is a sort of anti-statist is wrong because obviously we're building a massive state operation but like an anti-state um you know, it's like Ruthie Gilmore, anti-state state, you know, like that there's, that this is, that that politics is happening um, in this. So I told, I do think that's a big um, part of what's going on. Uh, I just want to thank all of you guys for presenting your papers. Uh, my question, uh, I'm going to butcher your name, I'm really sorry, is it LaFloria? Thank you. Um, so I, I really appreciated your, your, your highlighting sort of the, the ways in which the voices of women in particular are sort of outside of the, the sort of general or the popular notions of uh, the way we talk about criminal justice reform and so on and so forth right now. Um, and I guess my question is, if, if, if it were possible to control for like, you know, sexism and misogyny and the ways in which society just hates black women, <laughs> um, are there particular ways in which black women engage or engage or are engaged by the criminal justice system or public institutions generally uh, that it, it, that render the particular ways in which they engage or, or are likely to engage that renders it that renders their sort of engagement sounds in particular ways. So it's not so I'm not just thinking about. Um, I, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get to is: is there a way for folks who are doing work in this area, whether they're scholars or whether they're activists, to make sure that women's voices are included that sort of extend beyond and women too, right? To sort of highlight the particular ways in which women are engaging these systems and they're sort of recognizing that they have particular interests that need to be addressed as opposed to, like, the, it's just different for women than it is for men. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is just simple incorporation and, like, essentializing them into this narrative about the fact that we understand mass incarceration is something that primarily and disproportionately affects black people, period, or black and brown people, period. So uh, black women and brown women are essentially a part of that pot, right? But for some reason, um, and it's not necessarily women who are saying, well, we matter too. They're only saying black women matter too because it seems that, you know, when we think about the black lives that matter, black women are not kind of incorporated into that that conversation naturally. So it's always a matter of, hey, we matter too. Say her name and all of these other sort of what should not be ad hoc or kind of tangential movements to this larger movement for black lives. Black lives are black lives, period. So it's not necessarily black women like, you know, making it a, a an and we matter too sort of thing it's they're saying we matter too because they don't matter in these broader movements I, that's just my that's just my understanding and that's just been my experience every time a black woman is killed in police custody or whatever with the exception of sandra bland how many i mean people you don't see national protests breaking out you don't see people filing out in the streets and you don't you don't see that and when we talk about the crisis in black female mass incarceration and the fact that you know the rate of black women now the numbers are beginning to shift a little bit i don't believe they're so now the new, essentially white women are now being incarcerated in, in higher numbers. However, black women are still disproportionately incarcerated. They're still, um, you know, receiving longer sentences. They're still overrepresented in solitary confinement. They're still facing all of the, but now the new narrative, they're becoming even more and more invisibilized, you know? So it's like, well, when are they going to matter is the question. Like, so, sure, go ahead. So it's, it's, it's not that I'm suggesting that, or, or attempting to suggest um, that, that, that the inclusion problem isn't sort of central to the ways in which black women are excluded from the conversation. Yes, yes to all of that. I guess what I'm curious about uh, is when you have a narrative about the ways in which black men in particular sort of are engaged with criminal justice, right? There's this, this idea of like um, uh, the war on drugs in particular is, you know, that, that particular framework is a way in which sort of you know men are stopped on the streets or men are Black. driving cars and women experience all of those things too.
I guess the question I'm asking are, are there additional ways in which women sort of are engaged, you know, around political decisions, be it through um, the ways and the discourses we have around welfare reform or the discourses that we mm-hmm. have around um, uh, women's health care or the lack thereof, or, or the, those sorts of things that are particular to the ways in which mm-hmm. women experience, you know, their political lives that lead to sort of a rendering of those, those experiences in particular mm-hmm. where that we just don't see them because mm-hmm. there aren't discourses around them mm-hmm. that folks who are doing work in this area could also, mm-hmm. like, the, so yeah. I just don't want it to be like a, we should include women, like, yes, we should absolutely include women, but also we should think about the particular ways yeah. in which women are engaging in systems that are just different from the ways in which men are engaging. That's good. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Yeah. All right. And so I've wasted all this time. I'm not going to, like, over... You know, I don't want to take up too much time because I know that other people have other questions. But I think that one way to engage women is to think about the plight of black mothers and to think about the plight of incarcerated black mothers or mothers who become incarcerated due to some of the the structures that exist that don't allow them to care for their children in ways that they can't. And then they end up being, you know, in prison because their children may not be going to school or because, you know, they may be brought up on abandonment charges because they went to the store to get, you know, some milk, can't afford a babysitter, you know, whatever the case. So there are some specific or particularities that black women experience, particularly around motherhood and the punishment of black motherhood, uh, particularly poor black motherhood. I don't know if that answers your question, but that. Rashi, you wanted to jump in on this real quick? I think so. Um, uh, the, the mic and I think I'm, I want to s- start with a provocative statement, um, and hopefully it will become less provocative. Um, and that is that I sort of bristle um, when I hear statistics like, well, black women are undergoing high, high, high rates of incarceration. Um, because there is a tendency, because in absolute terms, they really are not undergoing anything like what black male incarceration looks like. There's a, t- there's a tendency then to say, well, and I'm, I'm, f- I'm really vibing off of Brian's comment here, let's make it uh, um, 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 raced and gendered incarceration and we'll just fold black women into that and show how Uh, how bad it is for black women as well. And why I think that discourse is potentially problematic is the following. Black women are housed in prisons that are very, very far away because their rates of incarceration are not actually as high. So why do we get a fluvanna? Uh, Because uh, um, there's not enough to have prisons, right? We haven't, we don't have rates in absolute terms of incarceration of, 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 of women in general that look anything like men. What that means is that you get places like Fluvanna, you get places like Julia Tutwiler uh, in Wetumpka, uh, Alabama, <coughs> where I, I work, that are so far flung that they are literally invisible to both the public imagination, you don't even get cell service out there, and what that means is that they're very, very far from their children. Their children are not seeing them. They're seeing them once every six months. You literally have to bus them in to these prison uh, environments because they are so remote. My point, and, and I know that was provocative. I see your eyebrow raising. Um, <laughs> the, yes, their rates are, 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 are astronomically higher than, than white women. But because in absolute terms they're so much lower, and to fill a prison you've got to have enough of them, um, we get this remoting and this invisibility, um, um, uh, losing self-service, they're so far away, that they actually undergo things that we need to theorize differently, Mm -hmm. I think. We need to theorize the parent relationship uh, differently. We need to theorize why is it that we don't know about medical abuse because it's hidden in these prison landscapes um, that are far flung. The other, the other aspect of this that I think we do need to bring in is the very high rates of policing um, of black women. And um, I have, you know, um, some transcripts that I'm working on where when you ask uh, black women how many times um, <coughs> they've been stopped by police in the past year, in the past five years, It's really, really high. Um, And I think we need to begin to theorize um, 
what does the relationship to the police look like? What does the relationship to the carceral environment look like that's different, that's not just an and, a let's bring them in because their rates are higher than white women. I think Dorothy Roberts has done really interesting work on the con confluence of, foster ca of the foster care system and the carceral system as it affects black mothers. Mary Katzenstein and Kathleen Waller, I just mentioned this article um, in the break, um, has done really good work on how carceral debt, um, even when um, black women aren't necessarily justice involved themselves, they are but a stone's throw from people who are do have justice involvement and often they're roped into the to the debt of prisoners they're attached to um, which we have vastly under theorized um, that they're literally there's an extraction of resources from black families um, and from the women in those families that's happening um, so that needs far far greater work um, on it and there's probably other ways that we need to theorize differently I don't think we need to just take what we've done on on black men's relationships to the carceral sphere and and I'm not suggesting we're doing that but there is a tendency to just sort of drop in the experience of black women yeah um, I, I just wanted to add a couple of other things I think that you know this is an ongoing project, and it's thinking about both the experience of incarceration, also policing and state violence, and its gendering and engendering. Um, one of the, I think, um, uh, things that we have to take note of is that I think that the core anti-carceral movement is led by women. Mm -hmm. So using that as a starting point, like starting with their activism and then working backwards to think about why that is, and that requires not only an individual analysis, but it requires how wis women are situated within systems. Mm -hmm. So the family is incredibly important. Mother's Rock in Los Angeles is important. I also think for this late 20th century period, however we want to term that, you know, the <laughs> extreme politics of resentment, <laughs> neoliberal era, you know, catastrophe, whatever we want to call it. Um, women, women's visibility in all forms, the left, or what we think of the left, has become profoundly female. And women were always present in the radical movement, but there has, and I see it across the board, in the labor movement, in the, in the, f you know, the vanguard of the labor movement, in anti-carceral organizing, in fighting for legislative change, women have become central. So I actually think taking their activism, starting with that, and then working backwards. But then I have a laundry list of things. Um, not only thinking about killing, but sexual violence and domestic violence Thank is you. core. So if we use that as a measure, and I also think it's important, though, also to foster this dialogue in a community sense. You know, I think we're all profoundly injured by this. And so in that sense, you know, women sit at the nexus of family and, you know, mothers whose sons are incarcerated are important to them. They also see that through a gendered lens. So I think it's important to think about this, how we work on this, you know, we think of this together. Because I think many of the women activists are fighting for, you know, that's the interesting thing. If we take it away from an individual model, then it looks different and it makes you understand more why women are at the center of carceral organizing. Because they're fighting not only for themselves, but for a very broad sense of family and community. Um, in terms of thinking about the war on drugs, the role of conspiracy charges in prosecuting the um, uh, family members, especially girlfriends and wives, is very, very important. Um, it is a fact that the drug economy was primarily male. It was. The crack economy was primarily male. And there's a whole gendering of violence to that economy. And many more of the consumers of crack were women. So there's a gendered violence in that as well. So it's not only the violence of the state, but also the ways that informal economy operated. So I think um, there are exceptions, but that's an example. If you really want to look at how crack affected women, you look at the prosecution of users, the you know, these use of rehabilitation methods, and um, Professor LaFlore can speak much better to this, but there's some brilliant work done by Jill McCorkle, Breaking Women, mm -hmm. which is an argument about the kinds of ways that women's incarceration is deeply influencing the larger national vision of incarceration mm -hmm. with subcontracting, use of pharmaceuticals, and medicalization. So I think that that is actually quite important for the history of women and for all people. Um, and yes, I also wrote down carceral debt. I think, you know, this process of indebting and the pressure that is put on women is quite important. Could I just throw into the mix that there's the big picture with the carceral state, but there's the, what happens in the facility itself and places of isolation like Coldwater, Michigan, mm 
the old Florence Crane Women's Facility, was staffed by members of the community that were the children of the adults that ran the place when it was the state school at the turn of the century. So you get this group of mostly male, young um, guards that had never been around black and brown people, didn't know anything about city culture, thought we were you know, very strange and um, too sophisticated for them. And so there's this idea that what happens to you in medical situations like this, you deserve it because you're a whore. You're a prostitute. You're a piece of shit. Or you wouldn't be in here and you had to do it because they convicted you. They look at your legal status as if it's their God-given right to torture you and allow you to die under terrible circumstances or rape you or impregnate you or somehow, you know, make your life totally miserable so you become suicidal um, because that is why you're here. That's their reason that they're the guard because they're supposed to do punish you in those manners. And so we went through a long period where we explained to them, no, the exile and the being away from our family is what um, the punishment is. But of course that didn't work and it resulted in the United States of America walking in with the Department of Justice and calling us to control center and saying, we're now your attorney. So we sued um, the, the state of Michigan and uh, in a huge settlement uh, and won, yeah, yeah, won, we won. We won the largest settlement um, on prison assault in, in uh, U.S. history. But that was because we had 400 plaintiffs, and when they called and started doing depositions, everybody was going up there with the story about, you know, they did this, they did that. And even, you know, women that were grandmother age were talking about, um, you know, we were all in here, let's say, watching TV, and the TV's over, so the guard at the, um, at the door shakes us all down in our pajamas looking for contraband when nobody's doing anything but, you know, sitting there in their pajamas so watching TV. So you're being molested, yeah. Um, and it, it was a terrible thing. And when it went to trial, it was so profound and so upsetting to the jury that the jury came back, found them guilty, and wrote read a letter of apology to everybody and so they went through two trials and then they of course they settled because there were women that were pregnant and they said they were lying um so um i just think it's important to understand some of the things that we fight against um when we're convicted and, and of course with a lifer you're always a lifer because they never let you forget it and you're always carrying that life sentence with you until you're gone Um, thank you so much to the panel and also to Mary for sharing her experiences. Um, really powerful stuff. Um, I appreciate it. Um, my question is uh, hopefully something that you guys can all um, sort of speak to. Um, but what I'm interested in is looking uh, at how the rehabilitative ideal sort of allows the carceral state to expand beyond the institution. So thinking about how things like indeterminate sentencing laws actually uh, contribute to like release policies so like the ability to actually supervise somebody who's released into the community um, for the remainder of their indeterminate sentence however long that sentence was um, so I was just wondering if you guys could speak a little bit about how um, you think the rehabilitative ideal has allowed the expansion of the carceral state sort of into the public and into sort of uh, sort of um, what am I trying to say here, <laughs> uh, poor and uh, communities of color um, that weren't actually supervised by carceral institutions but were more sort of policed uh, heavily in the first half of the 20th century. Um, so just thinking about like the expansion of these kinds of apparatus and how they actually function. I guess like an immediate example of that would be the parole system. Um, and that you know system has existed since the late 19th, early 20th century, and essentially, you know, just to draw back on my earlier work on um, incarcerated Black women in the post Civil War South, essentially parole, you know, it was equally abusive. It was an extension of rehabilitation, but really, it just allowed for you know incarcerated women to be surveillance by the state, but then to be forced to work, you know, for. Um, white uh, within white households where they would be subjected to sexual violence and all forms of you know um, violence and it was another way of commodifying or or extracting wealth you know from their from their bodies and so today you know because of all the the parole violations and people having to pay you know um, literally with time and with money um, not having adequate resources not having adequate transportation there's really no 
apparatus in place to help them to successfully be paroled. And so I think that that's another one of those like failures of rehabilitation. One last question before the break. Um, thank you. This has been a great panel and a great um, conversation. Um, so I just wanted to add one thing to the really interesting conversation that got sparked off on the kind of particularities of, of um, gendered incarceration. And, and um, I mean, this isn't based on an, on research, but more just sort of anecdotal. Um, but what you know, one of the um, you know, one of the the, the ways in which uh, women um, get in, get incarcerated, uh, I think, you know, I, I think you were referring to this a little bit in your answer, but, um, you know, uh, often as sort of accessories and it, it gets involved in kind of relationships, um, you know, people who are um, sort of, uh, you know, accused as, as accessories and convicted as accessories. And then, you know, one really important, I think, particularity um, is the, the question of domestic violence. I think you alluded to that too, but, you know, here in Maryland, we're not a, we're not a state where, um, where uh, defense against domestic violence is, is, um, can be used as you know exculpatory. I mean that's not something. So so you know if you are defending yourself in a domestic violence situation, you will go to um, you will go to prison for that. You'll be convicted for that. Um, uh, I had two questions. One about the the medical um, uh, medical abuse. I mean it was it, it's a really you know when when you first started talking about it, I was thinking okay so what does how does one define medical abuse? Um, and the cases you um, you talked about are all you know really horrifying and I, I, I can't imagine anyone taking the, the opposite side, but it nevertheless seems to me a, a complicated question, particularly in a, in a context of, of prison where um, consent is almost by definition, you know, impossible. Um, now, you know, when you go to the uh, um, hospital or doctor's office um, in civil life, you're asked to sign all these forms, these consent forms, yeah, you know, they don't, they don't do anything without your pre preliminary consent. So in, in this context, you know, where does one draw the line? Where does, uh, you know, or is every kind of medical procedure almost by definition abusive? Um, and, and then the, um, and then the last, the last question uh, goes to um, uh, Professor Kohler Hausman. Um, and then, I mean, I understood what you were saying about the indeterminate sentencing and why that would be, um, you know, why that would be so frustrating, why that would cause so much dissension um, and resistance and, the, you know, the capricious nature of that and the way one has to perform. Um, the, uh, the the sort of apologetics in order to to to, to, um, to be released, uh, but but that presumably would always have been um, embedded in the system from the get go. And you, I think you said this was this had stretched you know for about a half century. So um, I mean, this raised the question for me about what it is what is it about the 1970s that makes it break down at this point, um, given that those dynamics that you were talking about, um, it doesn't sound like they would have changed a great deal, or maybe they did. Thanks. Um, in terms of like defining medical abuse, I don't believe that all um, medical treatment is abusive. Um, I, I do believe that there are some instances when you know people do profit from receiving quality medical care, you know, in prison. Um, however, it becomes abusive when an individual is neglected, you know, even the most basic standard of medical care, when their complaints of illness are ignored, when um, withholding their medication becomes a form of punishment, particularly p for people with, you know, mental illness and a number of, a variety of other types of, you know, um, illnesses that are not necessarily, you know, manifest in physical ways. So there are ways that um, the denial of medical care is used as a form of punishment and it truly is an extension of the kinds of abuses that people experience in terms of physical violence, sexual violence. It's just another um, way of abusing incarcerated people. Um, no, thank you for that question. I think that uh, to, to be, I know we're running out of time, so to be, to be brief, I would say that it was sort of a, there's a cocktail of things. I mean, this is what I, I, would, argue, I would argue that first, the rehabilitative ideal um, that, that we're talking about, a, the first thing is there's a dramatic change in the prison population. And so I think that we have, a, that as the prison population becomes more, um, more, Afri more African American, more Latino, that there's th that that in a sort of broader societal fault, like starts, these are populations that had, um, I'm talking about California case, by the way, right now. I think that's part of people being like, wait, what are we, you know, uh, to the other earlier question before, like, why are we giving people, all these people, these services? You know, that there's these kind of, the idea of rehabilitation is, re is redistributing, um, you know, giving state services to folks um, that, 
in, in like get, getting claim. So, so there was this sort of politics of resentment angle that got more intensified because of the racial shifts at the precise moment where movements were making more were making more claims on sort of citizenship rights broadly. But then the key thing I think is really that there's actually organized prison. There's, there's a really profound prison organizing happening within the institution, which itself is really destab you know, destabilized. I mean, I think that's really a key piece in the 1970s. Um, and I think that, that, that what you have is there, that this kind of creates this, co this sort of unholy coalition where there's really no one left standing defending it. I mean, that's sort of what's amazing about this moment is that there's, that actually, you know, like, Guards don't like it because they because it means that like they they, they resent it because it means that these like these people these like social workers have authority within the prison that pisses them off. I mean like there's like very few I mean there's very few people that are willing to like go to the bar by the time that the sort of the critics from the the, the really profound critics from the, the um, from the left come in and then I do think it gets tied into sort of broader politics of new groups making claims on the state at this particular moment. But there is no doubt folks were challenging. <laughs> We're, we're had issues with parole boards and we're challenging it way, 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 you know, um, before this period, unquestionably. And you might have some more. Um, yeah, I was just, th that question, you know, I think that um, actually Professor Weaver's work on the front lash is incredibly important here about thinking about the 1970s. You know, I'm convinced by both professors, Professor Wee um, Weaver's arguments and also Jordan Camp's arguments and in incarcerating the crisis about thinking about the 1970s as a period of revanchism. And he's ar he uses the word revanchism, which was a term that was originally used in talking about the Mexican War, about the reclamation, the, the seizure of lands. And I think that that's useful. I mean, you did have a mass, the profundity of what happened in the 60s and 70s, the way it, it shook the foundations of the United States, because of course, it's foundations are slavery and disfranchisement. And you have this massive mobilization. You have prisoners who are, are unhappy with the indeterminate sentencing. I first learned about indeterminate sentencing actually in the archives reading about George Jackson mm -hmm. and his case to me. And, and Dan Berger could speak to this best of all. But, um, but people didn't have the power to control what came after. <coughs> and so this, this period of destabilization, right, there is a kind of revanchism where, you know, um, forces of reaction are well positioned to craft something, in my opinion, that was worse. I, I mean, we could have a discussion about that, but I mean, rehabilitation was quite bad, but what comes after uh, is the three strikes law, the, you know, this mass, mass criminalization. So that's why I mentioned intensification. I think that is quite important. We don't have to romanticize the rehabilitative ideal, but we do also have to deal with total numbers, what's happening, gang injunctions, you know, in 1989, there are over 100 anti-gang measures passed, as I think as Jalili said, it was this like, you know, orgy of state violence, where they are, you know, you have prosecutors wearing flap jackets dressed up like they're the Ramparts unit, right? So it was always bad, but I think there are ways in which, for me, there is, you know, a whole series of forces are, al well, I don't want it to sound so conspiratorial, but, you know, some of the destabilization of the 1970s, th the, the people that ultimately were able to determine criminal justice policy, welfare policy, you know, they offered, in my opinion, uh, really profoundly reactionary, revanchist solutions. Can I just read, I, I had to cut this for, but there's three sentences that actually really speak to exactly what you're saying, and I just want to read, these are actually, it's actually not my word, these are from a, um, from the outlaw. Um, I'm, this is a, a, mag a newspaper published by, uh, by incarcerated people, um, and they said, what we ended up with here in California, as it seems to be the case in other states, is the worst of both systems, the old rehabilitative system and a new justice or better punishment system. We have all the discretion needed to discriminate between the weak and the powerful, which is one of the critiques about the old system, and now more punishment is heaped on those selected. Now they call it punishment and feel righteous about it. So I feel like that kind of captures sort of what the second part of the story that I agree. Well, it remains to have us thank the panelists for their contributions this afternoon.
So we are going to take about a half an hour break. We're going to reconvene at a quarter to five. There are uh, refueling refreshments outside, coffee and carbs, which is the order of the day for most of us to get through. Um, I also want to remake the announcement I made at the start of the day for those who might have trickled in and might be expecting something different on the program. Um, Professor Sadia Hartman had to cancel due to health issues in the family, so she will not be here. So instead, what we will have is a discussion about possibilities and problems of the carceral society with one speaker just kind of you know moderating and anchoring. So Dan Berger has been uh, kind enough to just have a short set of remarks, like literally three minutes to then open up for us to you know begin to have a discussion about one, I think a continuation of the discussion about methodologies, techniques and approaches, but also, you know, I think it's a really nice dovetail to have a very concrete sense about what what historical processes have gotten us to this point. And so looking and taking stock very concretely about what exactly are the possibilities relative to law, to policy, to institutions, to fundraising that we might be able to swap notes and share about. So that'll be what we'll end with this afternoon. So by all means, please partake, refuel, um, and yeah, don't commiserate, so as, uh, except collaborate, collaborate.